gonna record this. That's that's our power. Have you seen um, our? So yesterday we did the the circuits. We actually ended up get, getting good success on being able to uh, use a regular sharpie and do the acid bath. That we after some trials we got that really nice actually. Um, if you look at the OSE Workshops Facebook page, there's actually good documentation there of us with the Klondike bars <laughs> uh, printing out. Yeah, in the room. Oh, we've got the the motor with the spindle. We've got a little battery holder that you can see. Uh, I just posted the battery holder that we're printing out right now. It's not there. Uh, I got to reprint it. Um, if you take a look at that you can see the last last post is that's post etching so it's really good so that's the power electronics Arduino circuit and then well next to last post and then the last post is the battery holder I just posted that up um, so you can take a look at that today we want to shift gears to the to the pie which is a, a, con a continuation of the battery packs and printing and so forth um, Let's see, do you guys have any, any uh, other questions? So I'm powering it. Um, yeah, I would say easiest accessible thing is if you have a battery lying around or any 12 volt battery, uh, the, the motor itself is 12 to 24 volts, I believe. So that should work. Perfect. So the, uh, the, uh, on the RAM split, the, the 5 amp is what we have with power right now. The other one, the other bus has uh, up to 11 amp potential. That, that's just, um, we would need a bigger... Uh, yeah, well, I mean, for the ramps, if you're running... Oh, I see what you're saying, because you've got... I think you only have, like, 2 amps excess after you count all the motors. Each motor will take I, I think the number there is five watts so you got five times four you already got 20 um, what else do you have for loads you got well you're not using the extruder actually so that is available by the way, it was uh, 54 watts was uh, um, uh, total, uh, some total of uh, while, while in operations uh, it was the more while it was heating up but oh. 54 okay so that tells us with the motors engaged or prior to engagement that was in the middle of a print that was in the middle of a middle of a print okay with with the heating happening right at that at that same time yeah you know it might be okay well if you ex Okay, that's really good. So that means that if the heater is taking 40 watts, which is what it's supposed to do, you're like 10 to 20 watts on your power supply, so you have an excess of 80. Well, that may just be enough for your motor. Um, that would be... Let's actually take a look at that. So if we look at that motor on... If you go to the master parts list, uh, just taking a look at some numbers. So on a J page, link to the program at the bottom, Steam Camp Master Part List. Let's take a click on that Amazon link. And let's see if you can actually do that, because that would be good. Now uh, here, we did that off a 12 volt battery. Um, we didn't put a CNC function, I just did it by hand. Let's see, where's where are the specs on that? Five 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 motor, okay, Amazon smile link. The numbers there say. Um They say no load current 
1.2 amps so actually you're perfectly fine no that so that thing on okay it's not that many amps it's only 1.2 amps no current so you're gonna get uh, maybe like if you're loaded down two or three times that I guess no load is 1.2 amps what would you say yeah the no load that would just be to make the armature spin with no no load on it and then you start putting a load of course you can consume more power how many factor of what's our guess two three times more I would say I don't um, know what, what, is, what is the motor say, what does it say the motor's max rating is do you have a rating in current or torque or what we do have a stall torque ah that's where you can get into there's uh, on the wiki there's a page called motor calculations you can actually calculate from the torque how much power you're using for a given RPM. Yeah, it's a little, uh, uh, I'm not sure we need to get into that right now. What, 470 watts per horsepower, something like that? Uh, you can Google a torque, right. The, but there's a conversion between torque and uh, actual wattage based on, so I think there's a page called Motor Calculator on Electric Motor Calculator on the wiki. No. Nope. What's the electric motor the calculator? I, I put it on there somewhere. Look for, look for watts and horsepower electric motor. Okay. Yeah, uh, we need specifically a converter between that relates speed, torque, and power. You can get an online calculator. They're pretty easy. But the, the relevant point for now is, Chris and Jeremy, yeah, you're fine. Uh, if it's only 1.2 amps, uh, I would expect the loaded down would be no more than 3x, three times, so like no more than three times the 20, probably more like two times. So try it. Um, you should be okay. The power supply, if it gets overloaded, I think it has a shutoff for uh, the, the power, little power supplies that we have. I do believe they have all kinds of protection, including overcurrent. So it will just shut down if you don't have enough power. But yeah, you should try it, actually. That's good. Um, I didn't actually consider that it will be enough. But for this motor, yes, it is. So go right ahead with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do that and, and do it as close. Like when you do the CAD file, the CAM file, do it as close to the Z-axis as possible. So you're going least into the into the idea of the lever arm. So you're you're most stable closest to the z-axis. So do that. Uh, that would be great. See what you're saying. So how the motor uh, uh, offsets uh, the drill bits just barely sticking. Uh, uh, well, the, when you when you have the full bed, what I'm saying is make whatever you're drilling like don't go so far out on the x-axis keep it close as close to the z-axis as possible just in terms of where you're putting it on your bed um, yeah that's good and Jessica can tell us about the success story of how we get to etch boards effectively here so we messed around with that yesterday Jessica fill us in on what made it go really well but come on come on over if you can parts hydrogen peroxide, three percent hydrogen peroxide, and one part the hydrochloric acid. Okay, come closer, closer. Oh, two Maybe. parts hydrogen peroxide and one part hydrochloric acid. For it was pretty cold, 42 degrees here, so it took 10 minutes. I think if it was warmer, it would work. You just need a really uh, kind of a new sharpie that has lots of ink. Our first passes, we were using older ones, and it kind of would fall off, and it you know sort of starts wiping itself off. Um, but yeah, I think we have success on this last one. It could work. They don't. There's some uh, sort of texture on the edges, but it's not connecting of the, any of the circuits. So <coughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, because uh, so we did this blue marker, which actually turned out like to work really badly. The blue sharpie, and we went back to the the black, and it worked great. And and also went to a different. Solution. Okay, and at first we tried two, two, yeah. per, two peroxide. No, two, two, two acid, two, two one. acid, one peroxide. It was too strong. 
And then we tried, that was a mistake, and then we did uh, two peroxide, one acid. And that ended up working really nicely. So what we have there is a circuit that we discussed yesterday. I don't know if you've seen the video. We discussed the Arduino power electronics. So we did that light dimmer circuit exactly. And it looks, it's interesting to go from the schematic, which Tom had on a, on the work doc, the Google doc, and then in reality, it's a bunch of lines and dots on a, on a circuit board. And you kind of have to think about it, how you translate one to the other. And that's where you have, of course, package like KiCad, which would, if you put that in there, it will lay out all the paths for you. I guess it's a, it's an interesting exercise to take that circuit yourself and just plot it out on a piece of paper, just lay out all the components and then draw lines between them in a way that it's accessible for the circuit paths not to cross each other. So, yeah, that's, that's really good. What else to report on yesterday? So the battery packs. Uh, look at the Facebook page. I'm going to put the link up there to that. But the idea right now is on the Facebook page, go d scroll down to uh, actually nine hours ago toward battery packs. So you see a one unit battery pack with a 3D printed casing and two bolts, Frankenstein bolts on the two ends. So here's the problem statement. If you want to make a 24 volt battery pack, you got to alternate the battery so one, the first one is facing one way, then you flip that 180 degrees so you can connect the leads. If you face them all the same way, they would all be in, in parallel. So you want to do this and, and have a way to alternate. Now, thinking about MacGyvering some materials, how do you do that? Well, we have access to wire, like say fence wire or welding wire around here, uh, and you have wire in your kits. But here, what we can do is if if we stack multiples of these next to each other, you can make external connections. So, let me just post this one up. You have the Frankenstein bolts. Hey we can take if we take this which is just a generic holder for a battery and you 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 have a five fold pack of that so that's the CAD CAM file the 3d printing file in the last post but the cool thing is you can actually connect them in series or parallel depending on how you wire the wires to the to the bolts there and once again we're using our six millimeter bolts from the overall system just like in the terminal so we're doing this this low part count kind of a construction set thing uh, and of course we can refine this so it's a really nice plug-and-play system with a power panel that we discussed a little bit yesterday and everything else um, so say you have two of them next to each other uh, if two or three next to each other take take three of them so so the second one if you flip around 180 degrees and the third one you also flip around 180 degrees from the former one if you connect the, the adjacent bolts then you get the alternating pattern where you're stacking the voltage to in, in series. If you don't flip the batteries, they're all the same direction and you connect all the pegs, then you've just connected them all in, in parallel. Does that make sense? So interestingly, this simple battery holder, it's just something, drew that up yesterday thinking, okay, how do we make the contacts? Because the challenge here was, I ended up with just going with the screws, because we know the screws are gonna guarantee excellent contact. They are conductors, and they can clamp down as much as you like. So the other alternative is, okay, maybe like put some metal strip at the bottom and at the top. Well, there's a little issue. Unless there's a, there's a nipple like sticking into the battery, like those are flat top batteries. They do not have like the pointed battery top. So to make a contact, if you use flat material, like a flat bus bar is challenging because the the metal of the batteries is just flat with the battery itself so you're not guaranteed good contact so we'd have to figure something out basically spring-like elements so I was thinking okay let's just take a piece of uh, metal rod metal rod and wrap wrap wire around it you can make a spring you can do that so then you'd have to fit that spring and all that a lot of complication a lot of potential for uh, loose connections yeah you can do that that's probably you know we might make this more complicated but here we're using like 
two parts, the plastic and a bolt, and there you go with the connections. And then you have wire that's external to it that now gets you the flexibility of instead of doing that those spring-loaded connections, which you can only really do like one way in an easy way. Um, so here we have the ability to, to wire parallel or series externally. And now the, the one more point about it is you've got, I mean, the Frankenstein bolts, they're exposed connectors. So you don't want to have that. So another design requirement is this is thing is safe. You, if you touch something, you're not going to short circuit things. So what you might want to do here is put a cap. Like if you have the battery holder, print another piece, a cap that covers all the bolts. So maybe have like a snap and cap, and then you, you've now covered it, and you've got this very nice, uh, very simple kind of a design. Now just I mean square square things. Um, look at the the last post on uh, Facebook to to see the detail. This could work, so we can put this up into 24 volts uh, for the welder application. We did not get to the welder. We were playing with the batteries, uh, trying to charge them. We were. Um, how many amps? How many amps is that going to throw? Minimum welder with a 16th inch rod will work, starting at 20 amps. These batteries are capable of doing that. <clears throat> They're rated for continuous 15, and then higher for shorter times. So. So you can do like five minutes of yeah, welding off of these. You have to use like a 22 gauge extension cord wire to yeah, you've got to wrap that and pull that around. You couldn't just use any wire, otherwise. You have to use wire problem. gauge sufficient to hold 20 amps. Uh, the ratings on that means minimally 14 gauge, like household wire, which is going to get hot. You want to get, you probably, you want to use 12 or 10 gauge. 12 is rated for uh, 20 amps continuous. So use 12 gauge wire, um, or if you have even your 22 gauge wire, wrap it around three times, four times. Each wrap is three amps, so seven times. Wrap it around seven times, and you've got enough contact to, well, if it's three amps, each wrap is double. So each wrap is six amps. So you need four wraps of 22 gauge wire to actually make a solid um, non-heating connection. So that's still doable that way as well. So this kind of design here is like super flexible. I mean, it's super simple, uh, V0.01. And we can go from here. But this will do for holding our battery uh, in an easy way for the welder application. Now, yesterday also we worked with, if you look at Don, did you put your rod holder on your log yet? Or? Yep. Look at Don log, and you will see. So, so for the, the welder application, which is simply batteries and then simply to a welding rod holder and a ground clamp, if you look at Don's log. I have notes there about what part failed and what part worked. <laughs> yeah. There's I don't solid have dinosaur. video here. Um, our ground clamp. You guys want to see that's that's the ground clamp. That's the dinosaur clamp, which didn't come out. It, it came out solid, but like the clamp we talked about yesterday. But we're gonna bite the metal with the teeth of this dinosaur. But it printed out solid, so not yet. Um, but on Don's log, we we've got the welding grips. So so basically, the welding rod holder. If you look at the DIY electrode holder on the wiki. There's a page, DIY electrode holder. It's in a work doc from yesterday there. Uh, we talked about it a little bit. Uh, we 3D printed a, an end end to it, basically the holder where you, you grab the, the piece of EMT, the piece of the tubing. This allows you to grab it and then also attach the, the wire to it. So if you download the welding grip, Um, here's my battery pack. Here's here's the welding grip. So you download that from Don Log. Open it up. It's a simple thing. So the the EMT tubing goes inside of it. Now this is not scaled up to the proper. It's a little small, right? right so I have notes about that. That the inner diameter of that shaft is uh, wrong. It's set at 15.75 okay. millimeters. It should be 18. Okay. But beyond that. Yeah. 
but this looks like to me like an electrode holder uh, so you stick a piece of EMT into it uh, you clamp it down with a bolt so it doesn't move and then there's a bolt hole on the back end where you screw in another six millimeter bolt and that pushes the inside rod inside that electric holder uh, inside the, the there's a metal rod inside the EMT you push the metal rod and that presses against the the welding electrode and then there's a second hole where you slip the wire in which where the wire now is clamped under with this bolt here against the EMT metal tubing so the metal tubing is your conductor that sends the electricity down to the welding rod so I mean this is simple it works it's great uh, good version one or initial version uh, this one actually here needs to be expanded because the, the we got the inner diameter here wrong but the concept is sound here so we can expand this to a larger size so that's great uh, we did that the ground clamp is you know just um, when you have welding you have, whatever you're welding you have to has to complete the circuit by going back to the ground of the of the battery pack so we need to add that so that's where we are um, any questions on this stuff? So, so that's that's all we did yesterday. We did a long lesson on a power electronics. We got into a long discussion yesterday on open source, economic development, and today we're going to shift gears into the Raspberry Pi tablet, building upon the the 3D printing ability as well as the battery pack. Just com completing the battery pack because what would be good for the Pi, um, each one of us has a kit of four uh, of six batteries. So if you talk about applications such as like long time video taking or time lapses, you want to have as many of those batteries as possible. So I would suggest using all six of them in this, in this battery holder. Now in this case, unlike the welder, you'd want to have them in, in parallel. You want to have them at the low voltage that the Pi uses. The Pi uses five. We have 3.7. So that actually means we have to step that up to five volts using a little circuit. That little circuit, the, it's called a boost converter. It's the blue circuit with the two terminals on it in your kit. Uh, you have, we have to use that if we run that off the battery pack. So for the Pi tablet, we have a power cord in the kit, but we also have the ability to do, to do the onboard battery pack. Now we're also going to have to figure out how to power it, how, how to pa charge up the batteries. We do have a little charger circuit within your kit. It's a one amp charger. It's a little tiny board, like less than an inch big. We have to build that little board for the power control, for the power of the Raspberry Pi. So right now, probably what I would suggest to get the most bang for this day, if we're working, you guys may be working on continuing and other stuff, but for the Raspberry Pi tablet, we want to start with, you got a screen, you got a Pi, and you got all the cabling, and you've got a power supply. Let's turn it on, download Raspbian, the operating system for Raspberry Pi, and install it. I believe it goes on a small micro SD card that slips right into the the Raspberry Pi is that what we have there micro SD card which you, you guys have uh, should have in the kits um, slip that into the Raspberry Pi and go through the procedure uh, Google it see what see what it is you can download the system operating system so we can basically get our working computer with with touch screen pretty immediately so it takes it takes downloading the operating system takes um, I don't know how long it takes to install like five minutes or so or uh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, five minutes to an hour, I don't, I'm not sure. Um, so install that and we'll have a functioning Raspberry Pi tablet already. Um, and then we can think about, okay, let's now, now that we have this, let's start mounting it. Let's, let's mount the, the power supply, you know, and make the Raspberry Pi such that you can make all the connections into it from the back. So we have to figure out how to mount everything in, in a plastic case, which we can 3D print. Uh, possibly 4D print in terms of uh, printing stuff on a on a 3D printer that's in bent in a bent shape, so you can unfold it with a heat gun. Uh, so that's that's what we can do. So the first step is let's get those. Uh, if we're working on that on a Pi, we can get those parts out.
connect them all and install the operating system. So you'll see that whole process of installing. I don't know how many of you have installed systems, but that's a fun process. You're basically taking a blank slate, and the point is you can choose any kind of operating system. There's Raspbian, there's some other ones. I don't know what, exactly what they are. Min sends OS. There's, is there like a small, small Ubuntu for Raspberry Pi? I mean, no. Yeah. Um, I think there is. There's a few of them, but um, the, the Raspbian operating system, it's, it's its own thing, and it, it's going to be most compatible. There's going to be more yeah, um, yeah. modular support for So it. while you have options, and you can, I think you can do like Android on it, mm -hmm. um, but here we'll focus on the Raspbian, which is most uh, most supported, and this, of course, gets into if we want to get specialized applications, like if we want to turn this tablet into a thing that also has a cell phone, oh, sorry, tablet. by adding a, a SIM card, we can do that. Uh, there are boards you can add on to the Raspberry Pi to turn it into a phone. I, I thought, like, that would be really cool. Then I can finally get one of my li lifestyle milestones of having a tablet and a phone that if anything breaks, I can fix it. That means instead of now buying probably like 30 more cell phones in my lifetime, this the one I have right now will be the last one. That's my personal lifestyle goal on this project. And also we want to turn this into a, a, pro, um, a product that others can enjoy. Anyone who ca really cares about closed loop manufacturing and the circular economy, uh, anyone in that audience should be quite interested in a modular phone that you can now maintain and upgrade for the rest of your life. So things like, I mean, the touch screen, that can live for a long time um, as long as it's supported. The, the Pi 4, it's got 4 gig of RAM. It's a decent, decent computer, a microprocessor. Um, in the future, like you can like if you put simple software, like if we want to take Raspbian and strip it down or maybe make a custom super lightweight version, we can do that so it doesn't have too much overhead or dead weight on it. Uh, those are all kinds of things you can think about so we can involve people who are into programming, um, I mean all kinds of applications, all kinds of add-ons such as Internet of Things monitoring, running print clusters, doing just about anything like I, I would like to see the tablet where I'm using the tablet and it's got my brick press software on it so I say run brick press and then you can turn it on uh, communicating to the DIY Arduino that we put on a brick press itself using a little uh, Wi-Fi module which all these pieces are now accessible for like a dollar or a few dollars so um, we can control the various machines you can also think about autonomous vehicles that Tom here wants to weed his garden. He's got his Raspberry Pi. He's okay, go at it. Um, for the robotic weeder and things like that. Um, so yeah, the Raspberry Pi is quite powerful. It's, um, what is that, a, like 1.2 gigahertz, is it? Something like that. I think it's four, four pretty, cores now, too. Four yeah. core, 1.2 gigahertz. Now that's pretty, pretty powerful. Yeah. So you can do just about anything with it. Um, so that's my vision, like, you know, I can do my, all the stuff I do my cell phone right now, I can pretty much get rid of it. And then we can, our goal here is actually we've got the components for the, oh, we've got a LED chip and a driver for it. We've got the ca camera module, so we can do those things. Uh, with the motor that we have, uh, the, the possibility there would be the little 555 motor, 3D print a gear down and create a slider for the camera. Uh, things like that. So, so there's a lot of different things we can play with. and. Uh, I would say for the first day, let's get it, get up uh, the Raspbian uploaded and run it and start playing with it and then start thinking about, okay, what do we do for the case? How do we want to design it? And the, so the first thing to coordinate all of this, let's build with each other. Let's coordinate that. So on a, once again, on a J page, we have the part library. So that's back at the very, the logistics section there part library for the Raspberry Pi tablet. You click on that and it's just seated. It doesn't have any of the Raspberry Pi stuff yet because we didn't draw anything yet. But right now I would add my battery pack as a starter battery form factor for the tablet. We can build around it and, and just keep iterating. And 
and we should coordinate by the, the 60 second rule as soon as you've got something uh, uh, put it up into the internet for my battery pack I did not have internet where I was working there in the workshop so I, I couldn't do it I'll do that now but as soon as you have it upload it so that in real time you can see like you hit refresh another you know you can see this part library growing or or the version histories like if you click on each for example if you click on uh, so you any file can you kind of see how you put it up there as you're working oh yeah so so I'm recording this so so the part library we've got once again from the J page we've got a link at the logistics section click on the part library for the Raspberry Pi tablet and we have a, just a started part library that's that's not the Pi tablet it's the printer by just seeded that so at the top you have just images of the evolution of this like if you do some new design like post it up there so visually uh, a person has a clue that a new thing has happened and then because I mean you can see that by clicking on all the different individual files which are right under the gallery but you see that each each file has a whole version history already it will have a version history but for you to parse a large team collaborate collaborative effort you can see in seconds that somebody has added a new part to the library otherwise you would have to go like say we got 20 30 40 modules at the end of the day I mean you'd have to click on each one and have 40 tabs open to see what's what's happening that's why we were suggesting this simple mechanism of of a visual picture so so do a so if you click edit you see how it looks up on top before the gallery so the gallery is the gallery part here uh, where you put in the syntax is like you see in edit mode mm -hmm. but up there do a file uh, that's a picture a PNG JPG and then do 100 px 100 pixels so that's a small little screenshot and when you generate those those little pictures what I typically do is I go into into GIMP and take any screenshot just reduce it down to like 20k because this is gonna start eating up memory don't put like a megabyte file for your little tiny screenshot uh, that's eating up a lot of bandwidth there uh, or memory like it's not scalable if I mean we're, we're gonna have to get larger servers quick if, if everybody did a one meg file up there reduce that 50 times to like 20k within GIMP uh, 20k is perfectly fine to see all the detail in there so then you got the gallery per row equals six you, you put in the format there is you you start with the JPG the, the image file you put a vertical slash then you can Put whatever you want there for descriptors in the descriptor we we put in uh, you absolutely want your free cut file what's also useful is you want your STL file for printing make it easy for the next person yes they can download the free cut file and generate the STL file but if you've got the STL upload it so the next person doesn't have to go through that process save them 30 seconds or a minute as we're collaborating those that kind of time adds up so you want to have the FreeCAD file, the SDL file. You might want to put some links to spec sheets or anything like that. You can do that within the gallery. Um, when when you in a view mode, you can see all those parts in a in a part library, uh, including assets like the files, any links. Uh, the first one is triple quotes is makes it bold. So the tablet final assembly. That's our placeholder for the actual Pi final assembly. So right now, like for example, I can right now add, add my battery pack. So I'll go um, file 5batpack.png. Uh, just file names, I mean, don't worry about it too much. I mean, there's gonna be a lot of files as long as they're clearly visible in a, in a part library, 5batpack.png. So, um, so call that a 5 battery power pack and then the free cut file do a placeholder for that so you know do five bat pack dot free cad that FCSTD and only tricky thing is how do you how do you there is no you can't click when you click save changes the only trick is you can't click on that five bat pack dot PNG you have to upload it separately you can use the upload fu file thing now good thing about the free cat upload yes there is a placeholder right there you can click on it and you can just upload the file 
so that makes it easy so you choose the file and upload it for the <clears throat> for the actual image that goes in there in the library you just have to upload it elsewhere so what I do actually is um, one way is you can do the upload file but what I do is I would do uh, the five bat pack PNG in a visual version history the little pictures on top so I would do five um, five bat pack dot png up there and now there is a clickable placeholder for that so now I click on that 100 px there uh, and now I can upload the five bat pack dot png which will then appear in the second placeholder here on the wiki so I'm at the part library for the Raspberry Pi tablet people remote you can refresh that page to see what I've just done uh, so that's the way. So this is like the as far as coordinating all the process, we we want to have this part library page. We can set uh, continue communicating on that page, putting down notes and comments and links, and we can check in later to see what's happening. Um, so I think with that we should go and build a tablet, which is really exciting, because right now we'll have we'll have the basic functionality like. <laughs> In fact, we can walk or go to the airport and actually use it. Uh, now, will it have internet? Yeah, I mean, it, all of that should be in there, That'd so you awesome. can bust it out of your. Uh, <laughs> here's my. Uh, this is the my own tablet that I use. Uh, thank you, at the airport. Um, now you might need. So, so Jessica actually leaving today, so she's gonna have that. But you can go to in the airport. Uh, take a picture, you know. I will. <laughs> <laughs> Here. Oh. <laughs> Send us a picture so tomorrow on the uh, OSC Workshop's <laughs> Facebook page we'll see our first Raspberry Pi tablet in operation in use in, in an airport as Jessica's getting back home. So, But but then we want to, over the next few days, we want to make improvements. So we've got four days on that and let's see how far we can get done. Um, definitely I'd like to, I think achievable is we got a nice case, we got a battery pack inside that we're powering so we have a whole self-enclosed Raspberry Pi that's functional. It can be plugged into the wall using the wall charger. It also has the onboard battery pack with the boost converter that powers the the <coughs> power port of the Raspberry Pi. So um, we have the little, the little charger that's on board. That thing can actually be charged by a USB connection. I think it's a... Oh yeah, so there we need a micro USB which you actually don't have in your kit. Um, but you can power it also through wires from a 5V source like, like the wall wart that we included you might have to get a cable or trim a cable to power up that little charger chip, but you'll see that. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's that's about it. Um, I think that's pretty exciting. So let's let's do it. Any other comments from the remote team, Chris or Jeremy? Uh, comments or questions on what you guys are doing, etching or mill or? Uh, no, we're we're gonna try and. Uh, uh uh, follow along um, uh, with you with the uh, Raspberry Top Pi build as well. Uh, at least get uh, get the software set up so that we'll be um, yeah. ready to try and uh, help uh, work on some of the CAD. Um, Excellent. But yeah. no, I'm, I, I, imagine, I imagine I will have a question uh, uh, in a little a little bit later, but I'll I'll, I'll reach out and uh, yeah, we'll we'll stay um, posted on the wiki. Yeah, yeah, and use the email thread that we have. Um, should we yep. check in later on to coordinate? Let's let's check in like uh, one, three, four, again today. See where we are to coordinate some of, on the tablet. We should by that time we should have the tablets running, and uh, probably before that we start working on a case and stuff like that. So as soon as you've got, I mean, I'll be what. Let's just keep watching the Pi tablet page. As soon as you have anything, even like okay, here's a simple version. Don't be afraid to to make multiple multiple forks of the same like say uh, you're excited about one you know Jeremy you want to do one version of the simple uh, case just put it up uh, we can combine that stuff later but just get everything up there you don't necessarily have to wait for say Chris to get his design because maybe we want to just like try two different paths that we're working in parallel and then we can combine that later so uh, because we have the different locations of people we, we can do that and if you were to do that under one file then you kind of have to carefully parse the version history to see which is which so it's fine to also set a couple of branches that we work from and then combine at the end because we could definitely do like prototyping of different things in parallel 
Uh, but yeah, if it's really convenient, if we coordinate more, um, we should start a good work document. Okay, actually, I, I would like to do that. So maybe before we go further, on top of the Raspberry Pi tablet page, I'm going to do a work doc. Um, so there's a regular template. So the work doc is where you explore, here's the design rationale for why I want to do something in a certain way. And that's like before you start caddying, at least start on a common requirements doc. I mean, naturally. Um, so let, let me just uh, seed that. Uh, make a copy, so using templates. So, so Raspberry Pi working doc. Raspberry Pi tablet working doc. That's, uh, that addresses the multiple multiple branches question. If we want to do that based on the requirements, we can. Or we can just all collaborate on one file or subparts of one file. Or we can say um, the breakdown is that's something we want to do in a work doc where we say I want to take this part, another person wants to do that, um, another part. So let's let's say modular. So so you want to do modular breakdown, and then we want to attach names to each part so that we can divide with some coordination. So we've got the case, we've got the battery pack, we got the screen. Well, screen is kind of self-contained. There's the charger uh, ba for batteries. There's the power supply, which is a separate thing. You just plug that in to run off the wall from the wall power. Um, let me share that in the 